This episode of Digging the Crates is brought to you by Scholars Entertainment, whose main aim is to assist with the discovery of underground talent through cross-border collaborations. Their first compilation album, Maintenance, was released at the beginning of 2020 on all streaming platforms and features over 30 international collaborations with the likes of Sadar Tex, Craig G and Blueprint, with producers such as Larange, The Other Guys, Mocker Only and more. With new merchandise, including vinyl pressings of maintenance and a collaborative album with Detroit MC Nolan the Ninja expected in 2021, be sure to follow scholars.ent, that's E-N-T, on Instagram to stay up to date. Listen, like and support Scholars Entertainment. Dig in the crates. Dig in the crates. The crates, y'all. Oh, come on, come on. Sometimes you gotta dig deep. Head back as possible from town to town. Dug deep in the crates where plates are found. Dig in the crates. This is Digging the Crates. I'm Vice Beats. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of the podcast, brought to you by The Find. The podcast focuses on exploring the art, passion and culture of hip-hop, going beyond the typical questioning and digging deeper into the passions, inspirations and experiences of those involved in the scene's rich culture, featuring artwork from Sick Film, intro music by Herma Puma and Jabba the Cup, and interview editing by Felix Payne. This time, the graphics are an ode to 1996's album from the Fugees, The Score. This episode features a Detroit-based MC whose path via Atlanta has seen her working with the likes of Apollo Brown, Tom Caruana, YU, Lex Boogie from the Bronx, and so many more. Her distinctive and defined perspective on the world around her has garnered attention and support from some of the most respected tastemakers and DJs within hip hop. This is Digging the Crates with Book Brown. And now for our feature presentation. All right, here, here we go. One, two, one, two. This is Boog Brown. How you doing? How y'all living? All right, now. We're checking in. We're digging the crates. Bite beats. Holla. Boog Brown, welcome to Digging the Crates. How you doing? Ooh, yeah, doing great, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Good to have you on. Thanks for having me. For sure. I just wanted to start by asking you, I know you got into rhyming through poetry initially, so I was just wondering what music and poetry you were originally listening to as a teenager that inspired you to write? Oh, man. Interestingly enough, I have, my answer has changed a lot since the first time I started answering questions. Um, Because when I actually think about it, uh, what I was actually listening to was more like R&B, more like uh, Anita Baker and Phyllis Hyman and Vincent Fanshaw's, George Benson, kind of like whatever my parents were actually listening to. And so when I actually got of age to be able to listen to anything, I started with uh, Outkast, AT Alien. Nice. And uh, Only Built for Cuban Links and by Raekwon and Nas and it was written. And those used to be the dominant answers, but then I remember how much I enjoy it, you know, as problematic as we discover it is now and know kind of in, in the back of our hearts and minds then how much we like Dog Pound and how much we like Snoop <laughs> and how much we like Corrupt and Dash. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Corrupt the Kingpin and that nigga Dash. You know what I'm saying? Like, they. No, nobody's really touching corrupt on, on the rhymes, but I digress. I'm saying this to say, like, there's so many others. Uh, Redman, Keith Murray, EPMD a little bit. I really want to mess with it like that. I really dug uh, Heavy D and Moni Love and Queen Latifah, of course. It was just yeah. like, 
there's so many dope poets and dope stories that kind of, that really influenced my life that I, I had limited to it to these three albums that I purchased first with my own money instead of really remembering that I bought some maxi singles that had a bunch. I bought a total maxi single. I bought, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the maxi single used to be the thing before yeah. even the CD came on. So I just forgot about all the influence that music was like, and not even just hip hop, you know? Like yeah. I used to play violin. So, you know, oh, nice. all the, you know, it's kind of, it's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting musical influence that I, once I sit down and actually consider the question. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's, it's really, really dope, you know, really dope. So did like violin come before poetry or like what was your, what was your mm-hmm. first musical exposure in that sense? Like what was the first thing that you, you Well, used? shoot, the first, first musical experience was in the church, singing in choir or watching my grandma sing in choir, watching my mom, my uncles, everybody was in church. So everybody sang in choir. So that's going to be the first experience, whether you could sing <laughs> or you could sing a little bit, yeah. <laughs> or you could sing very, very like extremely well, like my older sister can. But well, actually, and my younger two can kind of blow as well. But um, me and my sister, my uh, second oldest, yeah, we could sing. But people are paying to see Christy sing. You know, what I mean, like so. <laughs> yeah. so we all we just first started in choir, and then it was violin, and uh, no, first choir, then piano. But I was, uh, my hand-eye coordination is kind of <laughs> uh, almost non-existent. <laughs> so enough. that didn't work out too great. But uh, violin did, you know what I mean? There was enough of a, a stimulant between my brain and my hand that I could, it was close enough to my face that I could see it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. When's the last yeah. time you played? Very poorly, about <laughs> the maybe seven or eight months ago. Oh, uh, cool. Very, very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I need some practice. I never did like to practice. Ugh, that was always my, that's always my crutch, my hang up. <laughs> I never liked to practice. Oh, fuck this, I'm good already. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of one of those instruments where it needs that as well, doesn't oh, it? Oh, man. Like, it's, uh... <laughs> Yeah. No getting around it. <laughs> no, it's definitely <laughs> not like riding a bike without one. Look at me now at 5'9", little chubby round the waistline, still fine. Never would have pictured I'd be spitting scripture glimpses of images in my mind. Giving you visual observations of my time. Like living through pivotal situations, still shining in line with the one, so I could never be two. Way I move is never optional to lose, so I pick and choose the pathways, knowing that the past days can't be changed. Take it with a soft grain, maintain beyond the garbage. Don't harbor ill will when it's time to feel. Seek to real and represent yourself accordingly. Ordinarily, niggas are hate. If you take one life that's slightly different, they might be wishing to be you. Gotta be able to see through the wicked, never taint your vision. Keep your mission true through the nonsense. Be about progress, cause God bless a child that's got his own. Life is what you make it, nigga. I'ma make it. No matter what it takes, my nigga, I'm gonna take it. You originally were raised in Detroit, so I was just wondering, I guess, whether you feel Detroit influences your music, be that your music that you make or the musical choices that you've made in terms of things that you listen to over time. Wow, definitely. Um, As I think about the range of Detroit music, from jazz to house, to techno, well, not not necessarily house, but some house, and to uh, techno and punk and hip hop and R and B. You know, I mean, it just goes on. You think about from Anita Baker to Aretha Franklin to Stevie Wonder to you know <laughs> Marvin Gaye to <laughs> you think about all these people and all these influences. Barry Gordy. You know, was Jesus, we're talking about Motown here. You know, we're, we're talking about, and even now we're talking about Third Man. We're talking about Three Sun. Well, I don't know if that would be based there, but you know what I'm saying? Like there are so many influence, like branches of this grand and great tree that Detroit is such, such a pivotal part of it all. Even even not even just listening to Detroit artists, but being in Detroit and having these formative exchanges happen with this music playing in the background. 
you know, watching my uncle sing and dance and like kill it, you know, kill it. I mean, but then watching him get in the church and seeing tears to your eyes, you know, it's, yeah, it, there is just too much to, the Detroit is always, <laughs> always and forever the most illest influence. Yeah, for sure. I moved back from Atlanta about three year and a half years ago. Three, almost four years ago, yeah. So I mean, what made you cho- move back from Atlanta to Detroit? <laughs> Everybody asked me that, and they asked me, like, with a little bit of asshole in their tone, too. Like, not saying that's you, but people are like, damn, why you leave Atlanta <laughs> to go back to Detroit? Well, <clears throat> at the time I came back, um, I was really on some other shit in Atlanta, and I had really lost sight of a lot of things, like uh, largely myself and my purpose and my goals, my health and all that stuff, you know? And I was like, you know what? If you're gonna be wilding out, you need to wild out close to home yeah. where you can at least meet your nephews and watch them grow up and, you know, see your niece grow up and be in touch or with your father and <clears throat> God rest my grandmother, but like, see and spend time at uh, at least a little time at least more time with my grandmother before she passed away you know yeah, for sure. these things are important to me my family i, I hadn't seen them and I, I needed to get back in touch with myself in touch with my roots because i had you know kind of been a balloon yeah. swinging you know what i mean <laughs> it's just just blowing and i I needed that. I needed that. And because nothing else kind of gives you a straightening like Detroit. Like there's just no other place where, you know, it's cold more more often than it's not, you know. So you have to be guarded, but then you have to be discerning and, you know, you have to keep your warm. You have to keep that. And that's a lesson that I learned in Atlanta, but also is being refined uh, here as well, you know. Yeah, keep your sure. cool in Atlanta. You got to keep your warmth in Detroit. Like you gotta, <laughs> you gotta really know how to balance those two things, though. Because <clears throat> if you are relying on the temperature of the the place around you um, solely, without you know putting on a coat or taking off a coat, <laughs> then you are, you know, you know, you're losing out. You're missing out. And I was missing the big picture, so I was like, you know, bring your ass home, Elsie. And so I did. <laughs> I did, and I felt a lot better. Ah, oh, that's good. I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, in terms of Atlanta, I mean, it's it seems like certain scenes within within hip hop have have come to the UK and are really present. I mean, obviously New York's like around the world, but there's certain scenes where, I mean, like the LA scene and certain aspects where I guess it's more defined and better known. But when it comes to Atlanta, I wouldn't say it's necessarily. The, yeah. I, I guess like the positive sides of the scene or like the more kind of I don't really like the phrase but like kind of underground scene or truer scene to to music hasn't really seemed to shine through just yet but I mean how was it being within that scene I mean did it I mean as you've as you've been within Detroit and other places as well I mean did you find the the way that hip-hop was responded to or created there was different Absolutely, because as much as Atlanta, like its population boomed after a while, right? And so there are a ton of transplants here. You got people coming around to the AUC, coming for school. So there are people from all over, people coming from all over to go to Georgia Tech, people coming from all over to go to Clark Atlanta, people coming from all over to go to Spelman and Morehouse and you know uh uh uga and georgia uh, state so you know you got people coming from all over the world so you had groups of people that had that interest in that essence of hip-hop not necessarily rap rap is a a a, a subgroup like rap is the thing that you do but hip-hop is the thing that you live hip-hop is a part of the culture it's the dress it's the vernacular it's the the freedom to express it's the you know, it's the very essence of what rappers do. You know what I mean? If, if more rappers would get in touch with the essence of the culture, then we could get a little more headway, I think, because then there would be space for everybody to exist. But when you're talking about rap, you're talking about a commodity too. You're talking about something you can sell, something that anybody can do. Anybody can rap, you know, anybody can have words and rhyme them together. Can you perform them? Maybe not. But (laughs) you know what I mean? But that's where the MC comes in. So it's like 
you know, there's there's so many so many uh, levels to that conversation, you know. Yes, Atlanta nurtures the hip hop lover in me in such a phenomenal and exponential way. I will gladly send you any music you would like from some of my favorite artists. <laughs> and if you enjoy them, please include them in whatever rotation that you, whatever crate you dig in, throw that one in it too. You know what I mean? Cool. So who who would you recommend that, that people check out within that scene? Oh man, my crew, working class. We worked over on so many projects over the years. Uh, working class, Dirty Drum Academy, Lex Boogie from the Bronx, uh, Ekandayo, uh, Sukkot Jones and the product. Um, what is it? What is it? Uh, so many, you know, I mean, there's so many MCs. So many, like true MCs, like Ekandayo is probably one of the illest MCs ever. Tripping, traveling, transitioning through energy fields. Energy is real. Moving when you feel like moving. Who's in agreement? We are free beings, not planted in the cement. Like seeds in the wind, we season the wind. Spice up the air, it's bright up in here. Who turn the lights up in here? But it's right up in here, so I ride up in here. Stay in motion like waves in an ocean or current on the breeze. I don't stay current, I just stay me. And it works out great. Then I splurt out skate through the work in any state that's dreaming, waking, sleeping, or transcendental. I believe my statements can expand the mental. Leave the spirit enriched, cross state lines and city limits. And I know that Sarak is, you know, relatively worldwide now. Uh, but Sarak is, you know, Atlanta based, you know, she from DC, but she got some, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? But Georgia is where I met this woman and like watched the whole thing blossom into such something beautiful you know star is one of like the ogs that i looked up to to try to figure out how my stage show should go what how i should project you know what i mean there are people there that formed that had such a indelible impact on my performance my writing my consideration on what i'm writing it, atlanta is truly truly a phenomenal place like i'm pushing the light either away or inside i could never decide i'm the yin and the yang the mask always on like dumbbell poems so many scores i had to forfeit bouncing out of orbit to absorb this understanding got me planning for the future i pray my hands remain fruitful maintain useful I'ma move through any challenge with balance Improve like a flower if the God allow it Shit Let's take a trip Take a trip where? I don't care I just don't wanna sit here Let's take a trip Let's go Take a trip where? I don't care I just don't wanna sit here Let's take a trip Take a trip where? I don't care I just don't wanna sit here Let's take a trip Take a trip where? I don't care I just don't wanna sit here Yo how did you first connect with Apollo Brown? Oh man, um, that was Twitter. <laughs> that was all, <laughs> that was Twitter. <laughs> so uh, I had been hearing about this group called Diamond District. Yeah. Didn't really necessarily put it together at first that it was Mellow Music Group. And um, <clears throat> I was a fan, like, dang, I'm a fan, you know? Dang, they, they dope. Boy, look, that brother YU, he be spitting. And um, then later on, a tweet came around, I think, that was like, you know, we should do a what, what, what could Brown do for you project. This is from Mellow Music Group, I want to say. What can Brown do for you project? We do Book Brown, um, Apollo Brown, and Kev Brown. Okay. And uh, somehow the Kev Brown situation didn't uh, transpire, but me and Apollo were introduced through Mike from Mellow Music Group. And um, kind of went on from there, you know? We got in the lab one time, uh, we did a photo shoot, but we didn't really have a lot of uh, actual interaction. Um, but it seemed to come together pretty dope, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. People really, really enjoy that project, you know? It's really a pivotal project in my career too because it was like my first big release, you know? My first labeled release, one I got paid for, one was promoted, you know? You got the photo shoot, you know, you got all the stuff. And I was like very impressed by that. And so, it's always gonna have a special place. It's always gonna be that um, that real real push. Like uh, every time I Google 
anything about Brown study, it was like both Brown and Paula Brown come up and it's like, you know, that will forever always be the point of reference of me on a more international basis. And I appreciate that because a lot of people wouldn't have heard Floyd Brown without, you know, that project and that extended reach. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's an amazing project. And it's, it's great that you kind of- Thank you. You can still feel the impact of that. That's great. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's real nice. Digging the crates with vice beats. Yeah, they smiling in your face. Behind your back, all they got for you is hate. Yeah, they smiling in your face. Behind your back, yo, they wanna take your place. Just smiling in your face. Behind your back, all they got for you is hate. Just smiling in your face. Yeah, they smiling in your face. Funny how the time change, strain some relationships. Turn your back for a second and they done flip the script. Oh yeah, they love it when you're down on your luck. Then reappear when they need you and be all in your ear. Like, oh, but you listen so well. Feel like I could tell you anything. Let me drain you empty with this energy. Like I ain't dealing with shit. Dodging rumors, I know two that came from you. Cause you the only one I talk to. Superficial bitches that be creating the issues. I just ain't got time to listen to. See me in my weakness. Say you'll keep my secrets and betray me without thinking. Then you call me fan without understanding the meaning. If I ain't love your mother, would have been said fuck off. Giving you the benefit, you hit me with the gloves off. I should have known you was a whole ass faker when I first saw the hatred shit. Caught me with the bait and foot. Friends like these, no need for enemies. Always with a trick up they sleeve, just like a fiend. They backstab us. Whatever's yours is what they after. They see you when you shine and wanna try to dim the light. They all smiles when you around. When you leave, they drag your name on the ground. Make me wanna holler, how could I have missed it? You on that pretend shit, fuck out of here. This ain't a friendship, this ain't a friendship. So what tends to be your typical process when you're creating music? Is it, does it tend to be that it's the lyrics or a concept first, or is it the beats that come first? When I was a more diligently practiced writer, um, as I get back into writing diligently, as I get back to into my practice, it's important for me to write more in the columns, in the margins about what I'm writing about than to necessarily hear a beat and write something. Okay. Where it used to be, I mean, I can do that and I do do that often, but I do want my writing to not be confined to a space. So if I write something and I have a BPM in mind, 92s, let's say, and I write it to the beat of that, right? But the the, the beat that the, the, the topic fits on, the topic of the writing fits on is, you know, 96 BPMs or, you know, 93 BPMs even. I should be able to switch my cadence. I should be able to play with the words. I should be able to edit. Should be able, you know what I mean? Not should, because should is a bad word for me. Yeah, yeah. But I am able to do those things. So because I'm able to do those things, it keeps my writing where I can just write the story and then let the beat come in or or let the beat uh, guide the story, you know? So yeah. I just really like to get into the process of feeling like, okay, I'm about to write the coldest shit I'm about to write ever before I even pick up the pen and pad, you know, as I'm thinking about like what I want to say or as I'm thinking like just flesh out the idea so that I can stay on theme because I've noticed in some of my older joints that I, I kind of be all over the place or can, can be all over the place but uh <laughs> you know <laughs> but that comes with practice you know that's practice too you know and I feel like when we talk about practice we don't consider hip-hop having to be something that you practice but when you think about um not necessarily right people or rapping I should say it's not something that you necessarily need to practice but when you think about a doctor for example who has to go to school for your you know undergrad and then yeah med school and then residency, like that's all practice. That's all a thing to get better and sharper and know what questions to ask and what turns to make and what, you know, and so with writing and music in general, you know, there's always gotta be that push and pull that ebb and flow with your practice and your art, I think. And so now that I've 
gained a better perspective and consideration for that. Shit, my writing is so gold. I like it so much more. <laughs> oh, it's really nice. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's awesome that you can kind of feel it, feel it evolve over time in that sense as well, and feel more, feel more in it in that in that degree. For sure. Where do you tend to record then? Do you record at home or like is there a studio setup that you use? I would like to record at home. I'm not a very uh, tech savvy gal, but uh, <laughs> I am not afraid of learning either. However, I do appreciate the idea that I'm here to do one thing and the engineer is here to do another thing. And because the engineer knows a great deal more about what is happening, I can learn some things from said engineer that will help in my at-home practice. But it will also help me as I venture forth to other studios to do other things, right? So I can ask those questions and know which questions to ask. Yeah. Say, hey, I like my voice to sound like this, and I like for, you know, to record like this, and to get a general comfortability with the engineer. I've been recording with this gentleman named Asar uh, at Isolation Records, and he's really been really, really dope. He reminds me of a, a cat named Mudknock that I used to uh, record with uh, on a very rare occasion because he was always super booked. Shout out to Mudknock. And so, just like Asar, they're both just super booked because they're so exceptional at what they do. And it's there's something very comforting to be in a lab with somebody that's just a, a, a virtuoso, so to speak, on, on a board that hears things in a song or in your vocal inflection or in the way that the song is playing that can also contribute. So I feel like that's also a part of the music making process that I really enjoy because there is a give and take. Now, if I need to do a reference then I got my phone out doing a voice memo. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, but uh, I'm hoping, I, well, I'm working to upgrade my my studio setup. Just even if I just upgrade my phone and get a program that I can record scratch vocals on and send them off and then, yeah. you know, have an external drive, even if it's something as simple as that. But I would like to be able to practice a little more freely in that way. Yeah, that sounds good. Who you? Ha. And where the hell have you been? Ask your girl, that's the three best friends. Four albums deep, sick with the pen, nice on the beats. Plus he could spin. She said she couldn't wait, wait for the next one to drop. He said, I love a female that knows the hip hop. She gave him that look like a head. Be quiet. That brand of game is so goddamn tired. He tried to play it off like for real though it's true. She said, Apparently I'm a born more than you. Ha. Acting like it's a new phenomenon, man. Listen to the hook to the song. <laughs> Your early work included like collaborations with people like 14KT. I mean, was he was he the first producer you worked with, or, or where did where did that side of things start for you in terms of the kind of more formal recording and and creating tracks? Uh, he was one of the first, definitely. KT is the homie, man. Like, he always uh, looked out like, yo, I, I, I see where you're going. I see what you're doing. If you ever, you know, need something, holler. You know, it's, it's always been that way. I, I'm hope, I, like, I can't wait to work again. Yeah. Uh, but I got to get, I got to, you know, I'm preparing for that. You know, there are uh, people that I work with that I, I really should have, hmm, not should necessarily, but now that I see the magic in it, I, I can do so much more. So I'm like, oh, yeah. let's do this again. Like, check this out. <laughs> so I'm very excited to uh, work in with him. But yeah, he's probably one of the first. Uh, Tarot gave me a beat. Shout out to Tarot, who's one of the illest. Uh, shout out to uh, Big Tall, because I feel like he gave me a beat. I feel like Quelle gave me a beat. I feel like, you know, all these people, but it was just so much going on. Yeah that it was like, I couldn't get to everything. It, it, that that happens to me, uh, well, that happened to me in the past, but 
now that I have a bit more discipline. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon. But uh, yeah, man, I, I had access. I have access to so many other illus and colas, you know, producers. Shout out to House Shoes. I think Shoes gave me a beat. Dez, <laughs> DJ Dez gave me a beat. Uh, I actually got a, a yeah, I got a joint uh, with Dez now that I'm like, damn, I can't wait to send it. But I'm like, I get that uh, that demo itis while simultaneously, yeah. simultaneously overly criticizing everything that I do. So, <laughs> oh, artist lament. <laughs> yeah, the, the perfectionism of creation. Oh man, get out of here. <laughs> So, I mean, with, with that in mind, I mean, that's that's quite a list. But, I mean, which, what, which artists would you like to collaborate with, you know, be that lyricists or producers? I mean, are there are there any that you'll yet to where you think, OK, I, it's it's in my sights, so I want to make that happen? Or, or you kind of got a dream list up there? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, I do. Uh, I want to rap with Elzai, Big Tone, um... I want to uh, get on tracks with Monica Blair, Idea, uh, like I said, Dez, DJ Dez, Dez Andre. Uh, I want to get, you know, it would be love to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with Black Gold and this cat named Mefta. I'm not sure. Okay. You gotta, you gotta check these kids out, man. I mean, you got kids. I'm sorry. You gotta check these guys and girls out there, gals and dudes, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta check folks, <laughs> homies, people. You gotta check these artists out. They are incredible, incredible talents. But you know, yeah, Dion Jamar. I want to work with. I want to work with a lot of people. But I, it's one, it's gotta make sense, and then two, uh, there's gotta be um, the space for it. You know, sure. uh, oftentimes in, um, when we're working, we get consumed with work. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, like nine to five, because I've always worked at nine to five. Uh, this is probably the longest time I've gone without working consistently. At least two or three jobs or, you know, one or two, of course, jobs. Yeah. But um, not having it now gives me the freedom to kind of free up this space and clear out some cobwebs to get more diligent about what it is I actually want. Because I don't want I really don't want to work a nine to five. So <laughs> how about I just like put in just a, a little more effort into what it is I want to do and see what happens from there, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's a good mantra. Yeah. I've been so entwined. I'm going out of my mind. I'm going out of my mind. Looking for my shine. Forgot to use mine. Forgot to use my shine. Wake up in the morning, do my makeup. makeup. Every other hustle for the cake up. Cake up. Back and forth, I'm struggling to stay up. Stay up. Seeing all my homies pass me by, and I'm like, wait up. But life is for the living, and this game is for the players. Yeah. Time to take a leap, spread wings, catch some air. Cause who said life is fair? Had my struggles with despair. Had to step up out the shadows, leave it there. Where, when, and why only meant that I decide. That's right, that's right, that's right. Said I've been so entwined. I'm going out of my mind. I'm going out of my mind. Fine tooth comb, I had to pick it, whip it, smack it up, flip it, strip it, right down to that primitive shit. shit. How did your collaboration with TC Records come about? Oh man, TC. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tom reached out to me for some features and we did a couple demos and uh, it was always love. It was always lovely. It was always a part. The artwork was always dope. Yeah. The the sound quality was always dope. There was always live instrumentation. I just, you know, I heard him, uh, uh, Willie Evans on one of his joints and then I heard Dylan on one of his joints and I was just like, yo, <laughs> yo. And so, you know, a, a very high level of respect kind of developed there. Yeah. Uh, I was in a pretty, weird place in my life when we first started working man i can't work he uh sent me uh, some more music uh a couple months back that i cannot wait to get on like uh maddie music do you know maddie yeah 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 uh, yeah 
I'm excited. I want to work with her. Like, so um, I've been sketching around and just writing some things. So I can't wait to just have the freedom to be in the lab all the time. You know, I kind of, I, I do want to, uh, that's the, probably the only reason why I want to like upgrade my, my at home thing, like so for features and things like that. So I could just send off rough vocals very quickly. Yeah. But like, I, I do prefer it if I'm working on a project to be at, at one, one spot. Yeah, so the sound sense. can be the same. Yeah, definitely. Kind of have that consistency. Mm -hmm, for sure. What made you uh, choose to release Summer Days independently then? Oh, I feel like if the artist can have the in, more control in the release and payment uh, thereof of said project, then we should do that because I just think that's a, there's a freedom in that. There's an act accessibility. And so while I am trying to reach more people, or the goal is really to reach more people, I, I'd like to do that. But also um, my super fans, my core fan base, always make sure that I'm uh, loved and taken care of and, and heard and seen. And so I, I have to move for them in a way that makes as much sense that I can give them the best thing. So sometimes if I need to take money from another thing to do another thing, I can. I haven't necessarily been approached by a label to do a thing but I feel like there are ways around there are ways around that I feel like that if that should ever come again then that that'll come again but out, outside of that I'm really just like a, I'm more independent you know I'd like to control the, the flow I like to see the profit I'd like to be able to make making uh, making music my full-time career you know so uh, if it makes sense in a collaborative effort and a collaborative measure, then yeah, let's do it. But, you know, I'm independent. Yeah, oh, that's good. The lesson, in addition to all that I have written before, I like to say on record that my efforts weren't quite as on par. Holding on the stones I should have used to sharpen my sword. Shake it off and get up on the accord. Time wasted, maybe, but how could I have come to this without having my own ego plate? Out of pocket, all the posture pushed me out of being locked in when I was right there. And then I dropped it, trying to be a star player. Last second should have passed. Instead, I shot without steady in my stance. Halted, exhausted, my opportunity to be seen. How could I not see? Eyes green, trying to be held on for so long. I could no longer breathe. Vision blurred, undeterred. Cast my pearls onto swine, calling a divine when I wasn't listening. I was just an infant when it came to implement the lesson. The lesson. The lesson. The lesson. Let's take a sec to think, to think, to Ain't think back. All we, all we have is, 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 is the dream. Ain't it the blessing? Ain't the blessing? So, so, so listen up. I mean, outside of rhyming, do you get involved in any other aspects of hip hop, like in the broader culture? Well, yeah. I mean, shoot, I dance all the time. <laughs> I'm not a no breaker, but I, you know, I dance. I consume the art. I consume. I support the arts. Yeah, is yeah. what I, I do mostly. You know, I did try my hand at DJing, but you know that all of that stuff requires equipment and an investment. And I think my investments were kind of out of alignment. So all of the things that I want to do, that I'm going to do, uh, I gotta sit back and restructure a bit before I do that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely gonna produce and I'm definitely gonna DJ. I mean, I love DJing, but I, I want to DJ with vinyl. I don't want to DJ with only DJs. I just love the way vinyl feels and sounds. Yeah. So I'd like to do that. But you know, I will, I'm willing to learn either way it goes. So do you collect vinyl yourself? Like, have you got a collection? I do. <laughs> I do. So what's kind of what's the gems in your collection? Ooh, I got a um. Hank Mobley, No Room for Squares. Nice. I got a Nina Simone, Four Women. Okay. Parliament, Funkadelic, America Eat This Young. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Here My Dear by Marvin Gaye. Uh, <laughs> so many. And then I got, you know, Nolan the Ninjas Project. I got uh, Nick Speed. I got House Shoes. I got Clear Soul Forces. I got, you know, Saw Rock. I got Lyric Jones. I got, you know, 45s from Dylan and, and 
you know, <laughs> you know, I got, yeah, I got mad. I got, I got some stuff. I like my, I think my jazz collection is coming along. I think, you know. Nice. I like jazz. I like old school funk too, though. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it does seem like the. I mean, you, you touched on a few more names from like the Detroit scene as well, and it does seem like it's it's a quite a rare and special, I guess, like subculture in itself, really. I mean, like I, a few years ago, Clear Soul Forces came to the UK and like mm. had had some time with them. Like they adopted me for a little while, and like they were just nice. cool guys. And like it just, <laughs> uh, it, just nice. it just seems like every every artist who who kind of makes it over here or, or like yourself kind of talks about the city and the scene just talks about it with such warmth and energy and, and it, even though there's that kind of balance of yeah okay it's not perfect it's like there's it seems like there's this almost kind of tangible emotion involved in in the scene itself and like this real kind of i don't know almost like kind of honesty and integrity to the art which you don't really see in that many places like it seems like it's a pretty special place really yeah i would say so i mean and then honestly like in any scene that i've i've, I've been to or, or seen or been able to observe like there have been their issues but there's also this great pride and and I, I feel like how can you make up music and rep like that without great pride and where are you from yes yeah, it's, it's makes a massive difference doesn't it oh yeah Get involved in the conversation. Use the hashtag DTC podcast. So, I mean, you, you've touched on a few little bits that, that might be on the bubble, but I mean, like, what's what's your plans for, like, 2021 and beyond? I mean, like, what's where, where are you going with all this? Oh, man, I can't wait to get to the UK. I can't wait to get back to touring. You know, I can't wait to get out and see new things and more things because and then get in front of other artists and record in different areas of the world and the country and just be able to create at, you know, at like at a moment's notice. I, I'm looking forward to be able to do that. Um, I got a project that I'm working on that's, that should be out, should be out for Christmas. Actually, it'll be out for Christmas. It's called a uh, theory versus practice because a lot of things we know in theory that we don't necessarily practice. And you know, it's about you know uh, application. I feel like, but then also applying pressure, you know, to to push, to sharpen, to to do that. So I think it's real dope. Uh, it should be out for Christmas, but yeah, I got some. I got a joint with Corona that's coming out. Got a joint with Slop Punk Dust that's coming out. Yeah. Nice. I joined with Des. Like, oh man, yeah, I got a bunch. Kind of keeping it moving. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, nice. Well, Boog Brown, thank you so much for joining us on Digging the Crates and, and best of luck with all your music. And Thanks, James. I appreciate it. Cool. And yeah, ni- nice to talk to you. And uh, yeah. Good talking to you too, for sure. Good night, yo. Good night. Or morning? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> That's new dad shit. (laughs) Peace. New baby shit. All right. Peace. I see the sun peeking through the blinds. I dreamt of new angles, new designs. No alarm clock, but I knew the time. I reached yesterday's goal. Now I move the line. Yeah, I move the line. Earn your sleep. Thank your God. Claim your seat. I see opportunity through my window when I look up from my let's go. Look you up from here in the clear and quite decadent. Delicate schemes and elegant dreams. Give you what you want when you down to receive a beautiful thing. Complex in its simplicity. Careful, you can miss me in the breeze. Learning how to roll with it is the shit. Whoever knew that writing songs would get me this. Not a fist full of dollars, but a couple less problems. Help me straighten up my posture. Write it out like desperados, like I'm gripping that impala. Cause my kicks so lean, ready for better things so I see it in my sleep, make believe in my memory bank, and give thanks like I already made it, turning the tables in my favor, thinking for pay dirt, gotta make it work, if I do nothing else I'm never wallowing in self-pity my nigga half plenty, half plenty, I have plenty Love. 
find out more about each episode, including the tracks played, go to thefinemag.com.